Okay, I'd like you to turn with me, please, to the book of Acts in chapter 16. This will be our third message on Acts chapter 16. And it would be tempting to just jump into 17, but there's a lot of good things uh, in this last section that we need to consider. So I'm going to begin reading in verse 30, and we'll read down to verse 40. Acts 16, verse 30, down to verse 40. It begins this way, it says, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeant, saying, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, The magistrates have sent to let you go, now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. And the sergeants told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and besought them, and brought them out, and desired them to depart out of the city. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. We uh, we kind of kind of climax last time with uh, this uh, uh, Philippian jailer uh, asking this marvelous question, what must I do to be saved? And then being given the answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And of course, we're, we're so thankful uh, for the simplicity of the gospel, uh, that it's not complicated. Uh, it's, it's, it's not, he says, uh, <clears throat> uh, when he asks the question, what must I do to be saved? And that's how most people think. It's like, I've got to do something. And the message of the gospel is, no, it's all being done. Amen. It's being done by someone else. You just need to believe in that, trust in that, and trust in it fully. Uh, I'm just sort of reminded of the evangelist John Harper, Scottish evangelist. He was on the Titanic the night the Titanic sunk. And I'm sure uh, you've heard of this story. But uh, as the Titanic hit the iceberg, he was actually leading a man to the Lord on the deck when it hit the iceberg. And uh, although uh, John Harper uh, had a, a kind of ticket that meant that he could go in a lifeboat, he chose not to. Because he said, the ship's going down, but I'm going up. And uh, he knew where he was going. And he wanted others who were not saved to be in the lifeboat so that they had a chance to hear the gospel. And so as he was in the water after the ship went down, he was holding on to a plank. And he was swimming up to people and telling them, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And there was one man, he was he believed just as he said it. And then just as... He finished saying, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Hypothermia set in, and John Harper sank into the icy waters of the Atlantic Ocean. And yet the man was rescued. He said he was saved twice in one night. Mm -hmm. Saved from hell and saved from the ocean. And he would go around preaching for years later, and he would say, I am the last convert of the evangelist John Harper. Wow. But the interesting thing is that in that situation where you're seconds away from slipping into eternity, you do not need a complicated message. It needs to be a simple message. And it is a simple message. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And so we, again, just uh, recognize the simplicity of the gospel, the beauty of the gospel, and that, that even a child can understand it. We're thankful for that, aren't we? 
uh, just the simplicity of the gospel. But I want us to see uh, some things about this chapter uh, that that we need to think about. For instance, he, he says, uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then it says this, and thy house. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean that if you believe, your whole house will be saved, right? Your whole household. What it does mean is you believe and you'll be saved and when your family believes they'll be saved as well you know as that message is available to everybody in the household especially when it comes to a member of the household it kind of opens up the whole household to the potential of believing the gospel and so uh, they we notice in verse 32 it says and they spake unto him the word of the lord and to all that were in his house. It's important you see that. The, 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 the message was given not just to him, but to the whole household as well. Uh, that's important when we get to uh, the next uh, couple of verses, uh, because uh, we're going to see that this is, it, there's a text here in this passage that has been subject to tremendous abuse. And it's verse 33, where at the end of that verse it says, and was baptized he and all his straightway. And what this uh, verse is being used for is to justify the idea of infant baptism. A lot of people take this verse uh, as, a, as a, a text to say, you see, all his household were baptized, therefore it's legitimate to baptize babies. Uh, and we want to just consider that as we think of these things together. But what we need to notice first is that it's very evident that he's speaking the word of the Lord, both he and Silas, uh, not just to the jailer, but to all his household. So uh, they're, they're hearing the word of God being explained. So obviously the ones that are in the household that are hearing it are old enough to be able to understand it and process the message, right? So, so clearly the ones that are hearing it, we're not talking about babies here. They spoke unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And of course, you can just imagine them drinking in this message. Their father has just minutes before contemplated suicide. Now he's a changed man. And by, I'm sure that they'll pay attention uh, of the transformation they've seen in their dad. They're all going to be listening and they're going to be paying great attention to this message. And the fact that uh, it, Luke doesn't tell us extra information that was spoken to the household would tell us that the message the uncluttered message of believe in the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved was the essential message that was given it's just elaborated on it's it, it's maybe going over it with them but it, he's not adding anything there's no addition to it it's just that simple message the message we've loved so much ourselves for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever what do they have to do believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life so that's the message the whole family drunk in these wonderful words of life their hearts were open to the gospel and i'm sure that paul and silas because remember what happened to them so they could get to speak to this philippian jailer remember they were beaten with rods they were put in the inner prison and so i'm sure as they were Watching this family literally drinking in the word of God and believing it, they began to think the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory yeah. that they are witnessing in these whole, this whole, whole family coming to Christ. And, and sometimes, you know, we, we, when we go through tragedies and difficulties, the Lord has a purpose in it. I mean, they've just gone through a terrible ordeal in the prison. But there was a great blessing that came out of it. And uh, sometimes the greatest blessings come out of the deepest buffetings. In fact, it's kind of interesting. One of the friends that I was visiting with in Quebec, I went to his home on Wednesday. And uh, uh, last year, uh, uh, his name is Dennis, uh, Denis Demar. And uh, he took me out on ice. I got to walk on water. We were we, we went ice fishing. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, since uh, I saw him last time, he was in a motorcycle accident, and uh, he's paralyzed now from the waist down. So I wanted to go see him 
And one of the things that Denis is an evangelist. And he said, you know, it's the most marvelous thing. He said, people come to see me all the time, unsaved people, uh, you know, to help him and all the rest of it. And he said, I, I used to have to go find people to share the gospel with. God's bringing to them, them to me every single day. He said, this is amazing. Now, that's a perspective, isn't it? Yeah. Amen. And so, again, we, we have to recognize sometimes when we go through difficulties, in fact, can I say this? I think we learn the most lessons in the valleys than we do on the mountaintops. Um, I, I was just uh, uh, thinking about this as I was kind of reviewing a little bit, and uh, I was thinking about the lessons the Lord has taught us in the hard places. And then once it's stayed. It's amazing. God just is so good at bringing good things out of what seem to be bad things. But uh, notice again now in verse 33, it says, And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he, he and all his straight away. Now, I want you just to notice the first thing. Well, this verse needs a lot of attention. First of all, I want you to notice the transformation, because I would suspect that this jailer, prior to his conversion, was a pretty callous individual. You know, he's been working with criminals. Uh, it, I, I remember years ago, uh, they were offering great, great salaries if you would considered being a prison officer in Northern Ireland. And I was talking to a friend of mine who was working in that area, and I was saying, I'm, I'm really tempted. This is, you know, I mean, yeah, this is a great salary and all this. And, and he straight away said, Mike, don't do it. And I said, why? He said, he said it'll harden you. Dealing with criminals every day can have a real hardening effect. So stay away from that. So this man, that's what he's been doing. He's a jailer, professional, and the, the head jailer. So cl clearly he would have been a calloused, hard man. And, and tough, and uh, and yet you can just see now the man who perhaps would have been involved in administering the stripes is now tenderly washing the stripes. Can you just imagine that? And so this man has been turned into this from this callous criminal uh, into a compassionate individual who's uh, washing their stripes. And again, isn't it one of the greatest evidence? of the reality of the gospel in that it actually changes people. It changes lives. It, it makes people different. And, and of course, one of the things that we see about the gospel is, although it's by faith and it's through grace, it always results in good works. Good works being, uh, as it were, the fruit of salvation, not the root of salvation. You know, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, uh, we've got this plan of good works laid out for us before the world was formed and so here's this man and already he's only saved a matter of minutes and he's doing a good work on these evangelists right he's cleaning their stripes and doing it with great tenderness and so again we would say the first act of a converted man callous callousness was changed to concern brutal language to brotherly love with his own hands, the jailer took a sponge and water and gently washed away the blood and grime and tended his prisoner's wounds. He couldn't set them free, but he could ease their pain. And again, there's something heartwarming about the sight of this tough jailer gently ministering to the physical needs of his prisoners as they, a moment before, had ministered to his spiritual needs. But again, we say that is what the gospel does. It makes crooked people straight, drunken, drunken people sober, profligate people pure. It's the transforming message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we thank God for every changed life through the gospel message. But then he goes on, and it says, after they washed their stripes, it says, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And again, we said that's one of the most abused texts in the Bible because it's been seized upon, torn out of context, and used repeatedly to support the doctrine of infant baptism, and it teaches nothing of the kind. 
Uh, those baptized <clears throat> could not have included infants since belief in Jesus for eternal salvation is a pre pre prerequisite. Verse 31, he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Verse 34, when they had brought him into his house, set meat before him and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. In other words, all those that were baptized were people who were capable of believing and had believed. Yes. That's the key message here. Uh, <clears throat> I read a very interesting story of a, a brother who was asked to collaborate in a gospel effort with a man who believed in household baptism. And some of the exclusive brethren, they believe in this household baptism based on this text. Uh, and uh, I know many uh, an exclusive brother was, was baptized in the bathtub by his parents as a baby. And so this guy is asked by an exclusive brother, uh, will you work with me in the gospel? And, and he, 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 of course, so why not? I mean, we believe a lot of things in common. But he said, no. He said, I, I couldn't do it. He says, suppose the Lord blesses and some souls were saved. I would want to baptize the converts. You would want to baptize their babies. I don't believe in that. <clears throat> why not? He said, it's in the Bible. I don't believe it is, he said. Of course it is, he said. After some fumbling, he found this text, and he read it out to me, and was baptized, he and all his, immediately. He pointed to the verse there, he said, that verse proves infant baptism. I said, you seem to have forgotten that the youngest child in that house was 18 years of age. He was taken aback. Where's your scripture for that, he says. Well, I said, I have as much scripture for that as you have for saying there were any babies in that household. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, he says, I have more because of the next verse says, believing in God with all his house. See, they believe that message. And that's why we call it believer's baptism, not infant baptism, believer's baptism. Uh, it, it's it's a, an outward expression of an inner reality, right? We're acting out what's happened to us. Uh, we died with Christ. We were buried with Christ. We we're risen with Christ to a whole new life. And so, uh, of course, a uh, marvelous thing. And, of course, Luke doesn't tell us where the baptism take place. It took place. Could have been the, the same river where Paul and others had first met Lydia. Baptism by its very nature should be as a public a ceremony as possible. Just as a funeral is a very public thing, so is a baptism. Because that's exactly what it is. I'm going to see a man buried today. Right? <laughs> that's what happens. Buried with Christ. <clears throat> and of course, risen to <clears throat> life of new quality. And so he and his household are then baptized, desiring to be identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 34, it says, And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. So after the baptisms, he brings them to his home and sets food before them. Now again, Paul and Silas are Jews. The Philippian jailer, we would assume, is a Gentile. It's good that they had got rid of those Jewish scruples. Can you imagine how it would have affected brotherly fellowship if he wants to lavish a meal upon them and they say, well, I'm sorry, uh, unless it's kosher, we can't sit at your table and all this kind of stuff. But none of that stuff. You think good that the Lord delivers us from those kind of things as well that would inhibit, inhibit brotherly fellowship. And so they're able to do this. And, and so... Uh, <clears throat> And no doubt, as they sat at that table and enjoyed that meal together, it was a case of joy unspeakable and full of glory. Seeing what God had done around that supper table of a reborn family. We notice uh, now in verse 35, it says, And when it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeant saying, Let those men go. And so it would seem 
that they, they'd been in the jailer's home, uh, which probably was adjacent to the prison. Uh, they had been perhaps down to the river, but he, he didn't have the authority to release his prisoners until he got word from the magistrates. So they probably went and spent the night in the jail because clearly the next morning, uh, that's where they are and they're told that they have to be released from there. And so we got an interesting uh, situation here because when the authorities come to let those men go, and you ask yourself, why did they let them go? Was it because there'd been an earthquake that night that maybe got them thinking about what they had done? Or was it because what had taken place was all done in the heat of the moment, at kind of a mob reaction? And after, you know, kind of uh, a night's rest, they begin to realize, oh, maybe we shouldn't have done that. It was a bit over the top. And so whatever the reason, they go to release them the next morning. But I want you to notice what happens. It says that uh, the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, verse 36, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. And I'm sure the jailer was delighted, you know, that, that these people had done so much. You can go now. You're free. But I want you to notice what Paul does. He says in verse 37, but Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. So what Paul is doing is he is basically appealing to Roman citizenship. They, what they did was wrong. They violated his rights as a citizen. You might ask the question, why didn't Paul say, wait a minute, I'm a Roman citizen before they beat them with many stripes? Uh, why, why did he say that before uh, they cast him in the dungeon? Why did they do that before they locked him in the stocks? Like, hey, listen, I'm a Roman citizen. You're not allowed to do this without a proper trial. Well, again, could it be it's hard to reason with a frenzied mob? People, when they're in that frenzied state, it's almost like they're uh, it's like also a demonic thing, isn't it? When the mob is kind of all in a frenzy, they don't listen to reason. They want their pound of flesh, and they're going to get it no matter what. And so, uh, so there's no reasoning with them. But now, the night has passed, the dust has settled, and Paul asserts his Roman citizenship. Now, again, why, why does he do this? Why does he uh, refuse to depart secretly? Why does he make the Roman officials settle the case openly? He used his Roman citizenship and legal rights to give proper respect to the gospel and the new church that had been established. If he just quietly moved out of the town, everyone would have thought that he was guilty and it would have hindered the work of the church. Also, maybe those responsible for beating and imprisonment without a proper trial, uh, would have uh, been emboldened to do that to more Christians, you mm -hmm. see. And so he's thinking of the overall testimony. But it raises an important question, and I think it's something that we need to consider today. When do we demand our rights as a citizen, and when do we just suffer the loss? That's a big question, isn't it? Because we have to think through these things. Because there's certain rights Paul gladly renounced for the gospel's sake. First Corinthians 9 is all about that. He, he, he could have carried a wife around with him, but he didn't because he didn't want to be chargeable to anybody. He could have received support. He didn't want to do that. There are lots of things that would have been his right that he gladly, as it were, refused to, to take. But three times in the book of Acts, he calls upon his citizenship rights, which is kind of interesting. Because it affects us. You see, in our constitution, as American citizens, we have certain rights. Freedom of speech. That's a right. Constitutionally, isn't it? So what do we do when we preach the gospel on the street and we're arrested for disturbing the peace? I have a friend in Canada that happens to him all the time. And he fights it in court every time. Why? Because he has the right to freedom of speech. And they're violating his rights as a citizen, but also shutting down the gospel. And while we have that right, we should assert it. What about freedom of assembly? 
Remember COVID? Interesting, you see. When do we assert our rights? When do we say, no, we have a right as citizens to do this? And so we have to think through those things. You have to choose the hill to die on, but there may be some hills we have to say, I, I assert my rights as a citizen. And again, it's not about me. It's about how does this affect the gospel? How does this affect the testimony? How does it affect uh, the, the work that God has called us to do? That Those are the big questions. And so Paul, because he wants to protect the infant church in Philippi from being molested like they had done to them, he asserts his right. And there are times when we must endure persecution for the cause of Christ, but that does not mean we are to be everybody's doormat or that we have to grovel before every bully who thinks he has found an easy mark. And so, again, we need to recognize because we are citizens, there are certain rights that we have. And when it comes to the compromise of the gospel, we should stand up for those rights. I'm not being radical. I'm just being biblical. I'm just saying this is this is clearly what the text is saying. And of course, we, this, as things get darker, these are, these are things that we may individually have to face. Right now, it's just theory. It isn't theory for a lot of Christians around the world. It definitely isn't theory. And, and, and uh, there have been instances uh, where uh, these things have uh, been very real, very, very real. My friend in Canada, he, he's facing this all the time, constantly fighting the right to proclaim the gospel publicly because it's enshrined in the Constitution. And we need to do that wherever we, we face those kind of things. And so um, I want you to notice what happens now. It says, of course, they, they were scared to death, these uh, officials, because um, it would be very serious for them if they were found that they had arrested Romans they had beaten Romans and imprisoned Romans because it was constantly against the Roman constitution and they would have been responsible. And so they come now as meek as lambs. They were kind of like lions the night before, but now they're like little lambs and they're, they're please, please leave, you know. And uh, so they came, verse 39, and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. And so uh, they... Uh, of course, the, the apostles are, are glad to do that. But before they do that, they want to go and visit one more time with the little gathering that's left behind. And so notice it says, and they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. Remember that Lydia, when she was saved, she said, to, you know, check out with the holiday inn, you come and stay with us. You know, we don't want you paying bills, you come and stay with us. And, and so she was, uh, her fellowship in the gospel was from the first day. And no doubt, because she was a wealthy businesswoman, that could be where the assembly met. And uh, what's kind of interesting to me is that all we get from the book of Acts is a little glimpse. We've got this, uh, this woman who was demon-possessed, who a demon is being cast out. We've got, we've got Lydia. And now we've got the Philippian jail, and I'm certain the Philippian jailer, before they left, they would have given Lydia's address to the Philippian jailer. If you need fellowship, this is where you need to go, right? You go to her house, you can enjoy fellowship together. And so you've got this little group, but how come we end up with a beautiful assembly in Philippi when they left after just, I mean, there's hardly anything there, right? There's just there's one family, Lydia's household, and the, and the slave girl, and that's all we know about. So how come later on he writes to the assembly at Philippi with the bishops and deacons and, and the saints, and there's, there's clearly a beautiful, orderly, loving assembly, but you don't get that in Acts. You just get this kind of handful of people. How, how did that all happen? Well, we're going to see that there's, uh, there's a definite reason going on uh, here. Uh, because we're going to see a change of pronouns here that is very significant because uh, we, we do know that in chapter 17, it says when they had passed through 
Amphipolis and Apollonia. This is verse one, Apoll Apoll Apollonia. They came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now, prior to that, it's not when they, but it's when we, okay? So Luke was with them in Philippi, but when they go into Thessalonica, Luke is no longer with them. They, Paul and Silas, are going. And so Luke stays behind in Philippi. And of course, he's a Gentile. That would not cause any difficulty or suspicion. Uh, because remember, they said these are Jews that are stirring things up. But they couldn't say that about, about Luke. So Luke stays behind and he works with this core group. And from that core group, we get this beautiful assembly. In fact, Paul later on will refer in Philippians 4 to my true yoke fellow, uh, kind of fellow labor in the work. And I wonder, is that, don't tell us who it is, but it could well be that Luke was that true yoke fellow who stayed there and established the work. This is very fresh in my mind because, yeah, just coming back from Quebec, uh, say yesterday, I was in Quebec City, two and a half uh, hours north of Montreal, and I had been another further two and a half hours north the day before in this place called Jonquière. But it's interesting that Quebec in the 1950s was the place where there was most persecution of believers than anywhere. Preachers were kidnapped and taken out of Quebec uh, against their will. I mean, all kinds of amazing stories about the persecution in the work in Quebec. And this Lord's Day, last Lord's Day morning, I sat down in an assembly of 160. We sat in a circle, loaf and cup in the middle, beautiful order, beautiful loving assembly. And you think, well, the, the original pioneers, they were chased out of town. Just a few converts left behind. But there were others that followed behind them and invested, and from there, something beautiful emerged. And we thank the Lord for what he does in places like this. Often just a call group, maybe the initial pioneers chased out of town, but God often sends in somebody else to just kind of build on that foundation and that was laid by those early pioneers, and a beautiful work is done. And that's exactly what we witnessed, and it was, it was absolutely delightful to see it. And so... <clears throat> There's a farewell meeting in the house of Lydia, and no doubt it was a very, very sweet time of fellowship that they enjoyed with these new believers who are going to be so key in Paul's life. In fact, Paul would say that that assembly, he says, nobody stood with me concerning giving and receiving, but you own them. In other words, this assembly is going to be his biggest financial supporter. They're going to stand with Paul through thick and thick. Amazing is that just from this, these little beginnings, God is raising up an assembly, and they, they so appreciate the gospel that they want to have fellowship in the gospel. They want to see it spread to other places, and they support it very, very beautifully. And so as we, we kind of draw some conclusion about this, this amazing chapter, uh, we we began with that, that amazing question this morning, what must... I do to be saved. And uh, again, we, uh, we pray that more and more people might recognize their lostness and might be willing to ask that question. And we might be willing to give them that answer. That it is a simple message of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then also just a reminder that when we trust him, the difficulties we go through are never without purpose. God doesn't waste anything. All the trials, all the difficulties. In fact, he's, he's, he seems to be an expert at bringing beautiful things out of difficulties. And we thank the Lord for that. And uh, we, we uh, just talking a little bit about child discipline and I, I can remember some of the best hugs and most intimate moments I had with my children it was often after a time of discipline. Is that interesting? You know, so some, God brings beautiful things out of difficulties and we need to trust him for that, whatever the difficulties are. And so 
This, these difficulties Paul and Silas endured through the hardship they met their man of Macedonia that they'd been looking for. And that's, that's what caused them to rejoice so much. Also, we mentioned, too, just in this chapter, the, the danger of being taken up with the powers of darkness. How did that servant girl, how did she get involved in the spirit world? How did she get this, this demon that told her uh, the future, so-called? And, and again, it's over curiosity with the powers of darkness. Oh, how we need to be taken up with light. Be taken up with light. Not allow darkness to grip us. And then <laughs> the work of the Lord progresses through difficulties and challenges. I said this last week. I've just been teaching the book of Nehemiah. I'm so excited. I've taught on Nehemiah for 20 years. And I'm so excited. I want. I, I was tempted to preach Nehemiah this morning, but I want to finish Acts. I, I don't want to be. I have a friend. He, he's a preacher, and, and and he always starts, but he never finishes any series because he sees something else. He's excited, and he goes on to that. And uh, I don't want to be like that. Uh, <laughs> I want to finish what I start. But you know, the book of Nehemiah. One of the messages of that book is that there's tremendous progress in the work, but it seems like every stone was laid against opposition and there always is opposition um, every true work of god will be opposed and we have to recognize that no true work of god will ever go unopposed and so are we ready for the difficulties and challenges do we if we want to build for god a minute that nehemiah says let's rise up and build the enemy says let's rise up and stop it yeah. we want to build for god expect trouble but expect blessing. Go through the book of Acts, you'll see that there's there's this same pattern all the way through. There's there's riot and revival. They kind of go hand in hand. You never have the revival without the riot. It's, it seems like they always go together. There's always opposition. Um, again, we were uh, just talking a little bit over this last week about, about uh, Wesley and the great Methodist revival and that that everywhere he went, there was a mob waiting for him. And it became a normal thing for him to have rocks and stones thrown at him, to have rotten tomatoes, dead cats. I mean, it's amazing the things that were done. But, but everywhere they went, people were getting saved. It was a blessing. And so uh, there was a time where it seemed like nobody was throwing anything at Wesley anymore. And he wondered if he was out of the will of God. Mm -hmm. And he knelt down by a riverbank one day and he said, Lord, is there sin in my life? Because you've said those that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution and I'm not getting any. And somebody threw a rock at him. And he said, thank you, Lord, I'm back in fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that interesting? It seems so foreign, doesn't it? It's because we've had it so cushy for so long. But nevertheless, what we can see is the Lord's work progresses through difficulties and challenges. And then what you see in this chapter is how sinners of various backgrounds are brought to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> One of them was by a careful exposition of scripture. Lydia by the riverbank. And they just went there and they taught the word of God to her and she believed it. Another, it was by a powerful exorcism. And then another, it requires the instrumental, instrumentality of an earthquake. In other words, everybody's conversion story is different, and yet everybody's conversion story is the same. It's different in the circumstances that bring it about, but it's the same in the message that is believed. Amen. And so we, we, we need to recognize that uh, there's no, you know, sometimes you, evangelism, you almost got this, this thinking that it's a pre-packaged formula. It's not, there's no pre-packaged formula because everybody comes to Christ in different ways. The message is the same, but how God gets people in that place where they're ready to hear the message differs all the time. So they move on, but they leave behind the core of a very beautiful assembly that will 
have great impact. In fact, when he talked about the Christians in Macedonia, in 2 Corinthians 9, he says, they first gave their own selves to the Lord and then to us. What a beautiful description. People that had given themselves to the Lord and it resulted in them giving themselves to others in divine service. And of course, that's always the picture, isn't it? It begins when we give ourselves first to the Lord in unreserved service. We've been thinking about the Lord Jesus, the perfect sermon servant this morning at the remembrance meeting and his consecration to the will of his father. Not my will, but thine be done. And yet, could we say that if we're going to be a, in any way effective in serving the perfect servant, we need the same attitude. Not my will, but thine be done. Submission. A, a first giving ourselves to the Lord. And then see what he'll do as we then give ourselves to others. So may God encourage us as we consider this this uh, very interesting passage and give us wisdom to know when do we yield our rights and when do we demand our rights as citizens. This increasingly may become the issue of the day and we need a lot of wisdom. Well, when is this going to affect the cause of Christ negatively if we yield ourselves? Yeah. Do we need to assert our rights here because it, it has huge implications for the saints of God? And so these are big questions. And there's no simple answer except depending on the Spirit of God to give us wisdom as we face each case. But we certainly need wisdom in this case. Let's bow our hearts and pray. Right. Our Father, we're so thankful for the uh, inspired, infallible Word of God. And the many issues that are brought up as we just go verse by verse through the scriptures. The relevance for our own day and our own generation. Father, we thank you for the rights that we enjoy as citizens of this great country. And we do pray you'd help us to know when we assert those rights and when we willingly yield those rights. Lord, help us to know these things. We pray, Father, that you'd add to this assembly. We pray for souls to be saved. We pray, Father, that we might see families transformed like the family of this Philippian jail. Oh, Lord, how beautiful to see a, a callous man becoming a compassionate man through the power of the gospel. Oh, Lord, do a work in our day. We want to see these things. Thank you for what you have done and what you are doing in many places. But, Lord, we don't want you to pass us by. We want to be part of the action. We want to see you work in our place, in our uh, circumstances, that we might praise thee and glorify thy name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.